How do you confirm that you are in God's will and doing what He wants you to do? In this video, I will share a few things with you to help you know what God wants you to do. This message is for children of God and anyone who wants to have a relationship with God. God can use anyone to serve His purposes, but He is only committed to supporting and preserving those whose hearts trust in Him. We can learn this from the story of King Asa of Judah. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, God told Asa, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. You have done a foolish thing, and from now on, you will be at war. But what led to this moment in Asa's life? Why did God say these words to him? Asa had lived trusting God and seeking only to do those things God wanted him to do, and God was there to help him. However, when he took matters into his own hands and didn't trust God for support and direction, he opened himself up to an era of struggles. Don't forget the purpose of this video is to show you how to know what God wants you to do. So, pay attention, my friend. King Asa was a ruler of Judah who had done many good things in the Lord's eyes. He had removed the idols and altars of foreign gods from his land and had commanded his people to seek the Lord their God with all their heart. He had also built up the defenses of Judah and had defeated a large army of Ethiopians who had invaded his territory. However, in the later years of his reign, he became unfaithful to the Lord. He faced a new threat from Basha, the king of Israel who attacked Judah and fortified Ramah, a city near Jerusalem. Basha wanted to cut off all trade and communication between Judah and the outside world. Instead of relying on the Lord for help, Asa decided to make an alliance with Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, an enemy of Israel. He sent Ben-Hadad silver and gold from the temple of God in the palace and asked him to break his treaty with Basha and attack him from behind. Ben-Hadad agreed and sent his troops to raid several towns in Israel. This forced Basha to stop building Ramah and retreat to his own land. Asa then took advantage of this situation and gathered all the men of Judah to carry away the stones and timber that Basha had used to fortify Ramah. He used them to strengthen his own cities of Geba and Mizpah. You could look at this situation and applaud Asa for thinking outside the box and using his enemy's ally against him. However. Asa's actions displeased God, and he sent a prophet named Hanani to rebuke him for having more faith in a human king than in the Lord. Remember that Asa took sacred treasures from God's temple as gifts to appeal to a man without considering God. The prophet Hanani reminded him of how the Lord had delivered him from a much stronger army when he relied on God. He also told them that because he had done this foolish thing, he would face wars for the rest of his life. Asa was angry with Hanani for telling him the truth. He was so enraged that he put him in prison and also oppressed some of his people. He refused to repent and seek the Lord's forgiveness for what he had done. Asa then fell ill and suffered from a disease in his feet that became very severe. Still, instead of turning to the Lord for healing, Asa turned only to human doctors. Eventually, Asa died after ruling for 41 years. And though he was buried with great honor in Jerusalem, he left behind a legacy of unfaithfulness and disobedience to the Lord. Dear Saint, a simple action of unbelief in God or a stubborn refusal to seek God's will for your life can result in a costly mistake that can affect a person for the rest of their lives. God's words through the mouth of his servant Hanani still echo to us today. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is always looking to strengthen and help those whose hearts are committed to Him, those whose hearts are always asking, is this what God wants? Will this honor Him? Is this what He wants me to do? Am I where He wants me to be? God says that He is committed to them as they are to Him. This should also tell you that when you neglect what God wants you to do, you should not expect Him to show you commitment. Yes, He will love you regardless of what you do. He will receive you when you turn to Him in repentance. However, just like Asa and the prodigal son, as long as you stay away, you will remain apart from the benefits of God's commitment to those who are faithful to Him. Now, as we go about our daily business, because we are often engrossed with so many things, waiting to know what God wants us to do is becoming increasingly difficult. 
Let's be honest. It's easier to ask and wait to know what God wants you to do when you are not under any pressure or when you have your needs met. It becomes difficult when you are under intense pressure and the options before you look like they will solve all your problems. Asa found himself in a similar situation with King Basha. Up until this moment, he sought after and did those things that God wanted. But the moment Basha attacked, Asa wouldn't take the risk of seeking what God wanted or waiting until he showed up. Asa probably thought that his plans were going to save his people. And since that was a good thing to do as king, he believed God wanted it. However, God doesn't work like that, my friend. You see, although something looks good, does not guarantee that it will be acceptable before God. That something is nice and favorable to you or to others doesn't mean that God approves of it for you. His word says in Isaiah chapter 55, verses six through nine, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In these verses, God is saying, you need to find out what my will for you is. You need to seek my face, my child. Leave unhealthy thinking of self-dependence alone. Turn to me and I will show you mercy. My ways are different from yours. Although your ways seem right, they're not always going to lead to the right places. However, my own plans and thoughts always lead to the right places. Maybe you are watching this right now and asking yourself, how do I know what God wants me to do? What do I have to do to know his will for me? Here are two key ways to know what God wants you to do. Number one, you can know what God wants you to do by waiting on him in prayer and fasting. Dear saints, fasting and prayer are still a thing and still they work. When you pray, you admit your dependence on God. It is not safe for you to jump into everything because you feel like it or because you can. Waiting on God in prayer is making sure that you ask Him for guidance regarding your next action. One mistake we often make is to pray during or after we have made the decision. We often say, Lord, if it isn't your will, don't let this work. But if it is your will, let me prosper. This may work in a few cases, but it isn't the best way. You should pause and wait for God's answer while you pray. And one of the best ways to do this is to pray while fasting. During fasting, you deny yourself things that normally give you pleasure and excitement, possibly movies, video games, food, social gatherings or events, just to become silent before God. In the silence and weakness of our flesh and minds, our spirits can connect to God and know what He wants us to know. Number two, another way to know what God wants you to do is by spending time in His Word. One of the areas of Satan's attacks is time spent with God's Word. Because we live in a fast-paced world, we want to jump in and out of the Word like we do everything else. We want short sermons, short devotionals, short Bible readings, and so on. We want quick responses for long-term needs in our lives. However, it doesn't work like that. God wants us to be committed to seeking Him in spirit and in truth. His Word is the truth that sanctifies us. John chapter 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. One of the ways to know what God wants you to do in any given situation is to give yourself to his word. Getting into the word will do two things for you. First, it will familiarize you with God's will concerning issues of life, money, dealing with others, or dealing with your flesh and the world around you. Second, the Word of God in your heart also gives the Holy Spirit the needed tools He can use to show you God's specific will for your life. For instance, you may be dealing with a difficult colleague who is threatening you. Then you pray about it and ask God for direction. He may speak to you through a verse in the Bible like Exodus chapter 14, verses 13 through 14. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. This could be received in your heart as God telling you, I have heard you and will take care of this situation. Just hold your peace. 
Don't speak to this person and don't resign. Just keep showing up and being a good employee. I will handle the rest. It doesn't concern you what he will do, but through faith and grace, you know what he wants you to do. When you obey, you will see what happens next. These are two major ways to know what God wants you to do, my friend. Now, when God responds, he can reveal his will through different means. He could use the inner witness of his spirit in your heart, where you just feel positive and compelled to do something without knowing why. He could also use dreams or other revelations and even clear instructions through the mouth of someone else. God cannot be limited. When we play our parts, He is sure to play His part and give us the help that we need. Do you want to know God's will for you? Ask Him in prayer. Spend time in His Word. Get His Word into your heart. And then ask trusted and mature believers for counsel. When you trust God for direction, you will never get lost. As Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. Are you at a crossroads, unsure if the path you're on is the one meant for you? It's easy to feel like you're navigating life's journey without a map. You might even feel that guidance is absent, and the signs you're seeking are just not there. But what if I told you that the clues you need are already being revealed to you, perhaps in ways you haven't yet recognized? You see, life has a way of sending us signals, little nudges that we're heading in the right direction. These signals might be subtle, but they are there, waiting for you to notice them. In this video, I'm going to unveil seven unmistakable signs God sends your way to affirm that you're on the right path. Number one. You're on the right track if you're getting the outcomes that will bring you to your objective, even if the process is taking longer than you expected. Picture this. You're trekking through life's intricate maze, a path riddled with twists and turns. It's akin to navigating a dense forest where every step is a leap of faith. But here's the beacon of hope. You're not just wandering aimlessly. You're heading towards a destination that resonates with your soul's purpose. The journey, albeit longer and more arduous than anticipated, is leading you closer to your divine calling. Consider the power of having a clear goal. It's like setting a destination in your GPS. Without it, you're merely traversing roads without knowing if they lead to your desired haven. But the moment you input that destination, every turn, every move is intentional, directed towards reaching that sacred space. The principle holds true in our spiritual journey as well. When you set your heart on a godly aspiration, be it nurturing a God-centered relationship, excelling in a vocation that glorifies Him, or simply living a life steeped in love and service, you're charting a course towards a heavenly goal. Now, let's address a common apprehension. Often the pathway to our goal seems longer than we expect. It's easy to feel disheartened, to question if we veered off course, but remember, the duration of the journey doesn't negate its validity. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, beautifully encapsulates this. He acknowledges his journey's incompleteness, the ongoing pursuit towards perfection in Christ. Paul's journey wasn't swift or straightforward, yet it was undoubtedly right. So, if you find yourself gaining insight, experiences, and virtues that align with your God-given aspirations, take heart. You're not just on any road. You're on the right road, whether it's inching closer to a spiritually fulfilling relationship, acquiring skills for your God-honoring career, or simply growing in love and grace. These are not mere coincidences. They are affirmations from above, nudging you, encouraging you, saying, yes, this is the way. Number two, when you are on the right track, God will allow you to go through examinations, trials, and even temptations that will benefit you. Have you ever wondered why life seems tougher when you're trying to do everything right? It's like the moment you commit to following God wholeheartedly. Challenges start coming from every direction. You might think, I'm following Jesus. Shouldn't my path be smoother? But here's the thing. Walking with God doesn't guarantee an easy journey. It promises a victorious one. When you're on the right path with God, it's not just a stroll in the park. It's more like being a brave warrior in a grand adventure. This journey will test your strength, faith, and resilience. Why? Because a life lived for God is lived on the front line of a spiritual battleground. Your determination will be tested. 
your faith will be challenged. And yes, you might even face temptations. But here's the beautiful part. These trials are not roadblocks. They're stepping stones to greater faith and closer communion with God. Remember, the Bible doesn't sugarcoat reality. Psalm 23 tells us about walking through the darkest valley, yet not fearing any evil. Why? Because the Lord is with us. That valley isn't a detour. It's part of the path. It's in these valleys, in these moments of trial and testing, that we often find the most profound growth and see God's guidance most clearly. James chapter 1, verse 12 offers us another gem. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. This isn't just about enduring. It's about growing stronger and more steadfast in our faith. Each challenge is an opportunity to prove our faith and deepen our trust in God. And the reward? A crown of life, a symbol of eternal victory and joy. So, when life throws curveballs at you, don't lose heart. Don't interpret these valleys as signs that you're off track. On the contrary, they are indicators that you are exactly where you need to be, in the hands of God, being molded, strengthened, and prepared for something greater. Embrace these trials as evidence that you are on the right path, the path that leads to growth, strength, and ultimately a beautiful, eternal relationship with God. Number three, let's take a straightforward scenario. You're contemplating applying for a new job. It's a significant step, yes, but not a life-altering one. Here's a gentle nudge from God that might be all you need. A sense of peace, an unexpected encouragement from a friend, a verse that speaks to you during your quiet time. It's not always about earth-shaking revelations, but about the still, small voice that whispers in the quiet moments of our hearts. Now, consider a weightier decision, changing your career or moving to a new city for a job. The stakes are higher the impact more profound. In such instances, God's confirmations are often more pronounced. Could be a series of events that align too perfectly to be mere coincidences, counsel from trusted mentors, or a recurring message that resonates deeply within you. These are not just random occurrences. They are markers on the map God lays out for us, guiding us towards His plans and purposes. And then, there are the life-defining choices, entering a committed relationship, getting engaged, marrying the love of your life. These decisions shape not just our earthly journey, but our spiritual trajectory. Here, expect God's guidance to be even more evident. It might come through prayerful discernment, wisdom from God's Word, confirmation through the counsel of those who walk closely with Him. When the decision holds eternal significance, the signs are unmistakable. Remember, as we navigate through life's labyrinth, it's crucial to lean not on our own understanding. Our vision is limited, our perspective finite. But God, in His infinite wisdom, sees the entire tapestry of our lives. He knows every twist and turn, every peak and valley. As Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5-6 through 6 urges us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and in all your ways submit to Him. He will make your paths straight. Number 4. Perfection is not our destination, but protection is our constant companion. This is a vital sign that God is affirming you're on the right path. Consider the rhythm of a Christian's walk. It's not about flawless steps, but about being firmly held in God's gracious grip, even amidst our stumbles. The essence of this journey is beautifully encapsulated in Psalm chapter 37, verses 23 through 24. It tells us that while we may falter, we're never forsaken. Our steps, though imperfect, are made firm by the one who delights in our sincere efforts. This path isn't about eradicating our human nature, but embracing God's nurturing nature. It's about recognizing that our missteps don't define us. Rather, it's the divine hand that continually lifts us that shapes our story. Remember, the right path isn't a straight line to perfection, but a winding road of protection and perseverance. Let's talk about growth and wisdom on this journey. Just as a tree doesn't cease to grow, neither should our wisdom and understanding. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15 reminds us that being on the right path is a progressive journey towards our spiritual goals. It's not static, it's dynamic, ever evolving as we hold on to the truths we've learned while seeking new insights. Reflect on the story of the prodigal son. His journey back to his father wasn't just a physical return, but a spiritual awakening. 
This parable teaches us that veering off the path can lead to painful lessons, but returning to the right path brings wisdom and redemption. If we find ourselves repeating past mistakes, like the sun might have, it signals that we've strayed. It's a reminder from Philippians chapter 3, verse 16 to hold true to the wisdom we've already gained. Number five, when your everyday choices reflect a heavenly purpose, it's like holding a compass where north represents God's eternal glory. Each decision you make, whether it seems monumental or mundane, is guided by this divine direction. Take a moment and consider the different roles we play in life. Some of you might be called the singlehood, dedicating your undivided attention to serving God. Others might find their calling in the joys and challenges of marriage and parenthood. Maybe you're navigating a career path or embracing the role of a stay-at-home parent. Each role, each decision, is a unique expression of your commitment to God. But here's the beautiful part. While our earthly roles may differ, our heavenly purpose remains constant. It's like a multifaceted gem reflecting the same light in different colors. The essence of our existence, as beautifully encapsulated in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, is to love God, love people, and do everything for His glory. So, how do you know you're on the right path? It's when your decisions Big or small are infused with this eternal perspective. It's when you choose kindness over convenience, patience over haste, and love over indifference, all for the glory of God. It's when your daily life becomes a living testament to your heavenly calling. Do not forget, our paths may look different, but they're all part of a grand design, a divine narrative where every chapter, every twist and turn is purposefully woven by God. So... As you make your choices, ask yourself, does this reflect my love for God? Does it serve His purpose? Is it a step towards eternal glory? Number six, when you are on the right path, you will attract like-minded saints and repel people who love their sin. Just as you draw nearer to those with a shared vision, you'll find others drifting away. It's not because you've changed who you are, but because you've become more of who God wants you to be. This can be tough, really tough. It might mean losing friends you've had for years, facing misunderstandings or even outright hostility. Remember, Jesus himself said in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 19, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. This is a bittersweet reality of walking with Christ. It's a sign, clear as day, that you're moving in the right direction. You're not conforming to the world, but transforming through Christ. And yes, it can be lonely. Sometimes it feels like you're walking a path few others understand. But here's the beautiful truth. You are not alone. In John chapter 17, verses 20 through 21, Jesus prayed not just for his disciples, but for all of us, that we may be united in him. This unity isn't just a nice idea. It's a living, breathing reality in the body of Christ. As you walk this path, God is aligning you with fellow believers, a spiritual family bound together by faith and love. So when you find your circle changing, when you feel the loneliness of leaving the old path and the joy of meeting fellow travelers on the new path, embrace it. It's not just a sign, it's a divine confirmation. You are on the right path, the path that leads to life, to growth, and to an unbreakable unity in Christ. Keep walking boldly, knowing that with each step, you're not just following a path, but you're living out a heavenly calling. Number seven, when we align our actions, our thoughts, our very beings with God's prescribed will, the Holy Spirit kindles a flame of peace in our hearts. It's a serene assurance, a whisper that says, yes, this is the way. Consider for a moment the two facets of God's will, the sovereign and the prescribed, God's sovereign will is like the sun's course in the sky, unchanging, unfaltering, the grand design of the universe unfolding as He has ordained. But then there's God's prescribed will, His hopes and commands for us. It's our roadmap for life, showing us how to walk in His footsteps, how to live lives that reflect His love and grace. When we veer off this divine roadmap, the Holy Spirit doesn't abandon us. Instead, He reaches out with a loving nudge, a gentle correction, it's not a thunderous rebuke, but a soft, persistent call to realign our steps. The Holy Spirit's conviction isn't about guilt or fear. 
It's about love, a love so deep it yearns for our return to the right path. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, speaks of a godly grief that leads to repentance and salvation. This isn't the despair of the world, but a constructive sorrow, a realization that we're strayed and a heartfelt desire to return to God's embrace. This godly grief is the Holy Spirit's way of guiding us back, of saying, my child, this isn't the way. Let me lead you back to peace. When we align with God's prescribed will, our lives may still have their share of storms and confusion, but beneath it all, there's a steady current of peace, a deep-seated knowledge that, despite the chaos, we're on the right track. We're walking in step with God's will, and in this alignment, there's a joy and a peace that surpasses all understanding. Always keep in mind, the path to peace isn't about a life free of challenges. It's about knowing that in the midst of life's storms, you're exactly where you're meant to be, in the loving arms of God's will. If you're a Christian navigating through a season of challenge and change in your life, this message is for you. Today, I'm going to share some signs that God might be using this season of your life to prune you for a more fantastic future He'll bring you into. We'll explore how God sometimes prunes us to make us more fruitful and ready for His purposes. But then, how can we recognize when God is pruning us? What are the benefits of trusting God in the midst of our pruning process? What should you do when God prunes you? I trust God to help us find the strength and encouragement to stand strong through this message today, in Jesus' name. Friends, life is full of changes. Some changes may be positive and exciting, such as getting married, having a baby, starting a new job, or moving to a new place. In contrast, some changes might be negative and painful, such as losing a loved one, getting divorced, being fired, or facing a health crisis. Some changes may be neutral and inevitable, such as growing older, changing seasons, or shifting trends. But whether we like it or not, change is necessary for our growth and development. Change helps us learn new things, develop new skills, discover new opportunities, and adapt to new situations. In fact, change often helps you discover things you never knew you could become or do. Change also helps us to become more like Christ, who's our perfect model, both in our spiritual journey and in our life here on earth. Let me show you something from three verses of Scripture to further clarify this. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. 1 John 2.6 says, Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. And chapter 4.17 adds, this is how love is made complete among us, that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. But how does change help us to become more like Christ in this world? The answer is through God's pruning. In gardening, pruning is the process of cutting away unwanted or unproductive parts of a plant to improve its health, shape, and yield. Pruning is also a metaphor for how God works in our lives to remove anything that hinders us from bearing fruit for His glory. But before we dive into the divine aspect of pruning, let's take a moment to really ponder on and appreciate how life unfolds. You see, we all go through various stages of change, from seed to bud to blossom and finally to fruit. These stages parallel our spiritual journey. Hence, sometimes when life throws its curveballs, it's a sign that we're at a stage of change that God has ordained. Jesus said in John 15, 1-2, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit He prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. In this passage, we can see how Jesus compares Himself to a vine and every genuine believer the branches. He says that His Father, who's the gardener, prunes every branch that bears fruit so that it'll be even more fruitful. 
This means that God sometimes allows or causes changes in our lives that may seem painful or difficult at first, but are meant to help us grow and produce more fruit. What kind of fruit are we talking about? The Bible tells us in Galatians 5, 22-23, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is the evidence of God's presence and work in our lives. It's the result of being connected to Jesus, who is the source of life. The fruit of the working of the Spirit in us is also a way we glorify God and bless others around us. I believe that no matter how introverted or how social you are, you want to honor God and bless those around you in a notable way. Beloved, God also has the same desire. In fact, it's the same reason He's taking you through what you're going through now. Have you ever observed a skilled gardener at work or worked in a garden yourself? Pruning is a crucial aspect of this work. Just like a gardener prunes plants to foster better growth, God prunes us to prepare us for more. It's not always what we expect, but how can we recognize when God is pruning us? Here are some signs that God may be pruning you to prepare you for more. 1. You experience loss or disappointment. God may prune you by taking away something or someone that you love or value. This may be a relationship, a job, a dream, a possession, or anything else that you hold dear. This may seem cruel or unfair, but you must believe that God has a higher purpose for your loss. He may want you to depend on Him more than anything else. He may want you to learn something new or important. Or he may just be clearing up space to make room for something better coming into your life. If you don't know this, you may think he hates you or doesn't want you to be happy, but that's not true. If you don't believe anything else, believe that his thoughts of you are good thoughts to give you a great future. Everything he does or will do in your life is aimed at achieving that. 2. You face challenges or difficulties. God may prune you by allowing you to go through trials or hardships. This may be a health issue, a financial problem, a family conflict, a personal struggle, or anything else that causes you stress or pain. It often seems overwhelming to deal with hardships that seem to have no ending. However, no matter how overwhelming or hopeless it feels, God has something better for you than this crisis in your life. Challenges or difficult times help us grow stronger and wiser. God will often use them to help us develop some skills or qualities and overcome the enemy's obstacles in our lives. 3. You feel uncomfortable or dissatisfied. This is a crucial one. It often happens when God's about to take you to the next level. He starts by disrupting your status quo. This may be a change of environment a change of perspective, a change of direction, or anything else that causes you discomfort or dissatisfaction. Because we easily get used to our comfort zone, this may be unsettling or confusing at first, but there's more in your future and God's about to bring you into it. Hear what His Word says in Proverbs 23:18: There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. God may be disrupting your status quo to explore new possibilities or opportunities. He may be driving you to discover new passions or gifts and pursue new goals. Whatever it is and wherever it may be in your life right now, know that these are some of the signs that you're being prepared. Don't get discouraged. Your future will be greater than your past. Your future will be brighter than your present. Don't give up. Don't give in and don't give out. Of course, there may be other signs that only God knows and understands. The important thing is to trust Him and His wisdom in all things. He knows what He's doing, and He has your best interests at heart. Joseph's story beautifully illustrates God's pruning process. It's a testament to how God prunes us for greater things. Joseph was sold into slavery, wrongly accused, and imprisoned 
But through his unwavering faith in God's plan, he emerged as a wise and powerful ruler in Egypt, saving his family and countless others from the famine that ravaged the earth in his days. In today's world, we often find ourselves facing daunting challenges, struggles, and setbacks. It's easy to question why God would allow these hardships. But, my friends, these moments of adversity might just be the signs that God is pruning you for something extraordinary. As Christians, we believe in a God who knows the plans He has for us, plans for good and not for evil, plans for a future and hope. Therefore, our perspective as God's children is built on faith and trust, even when life seems to be falling apart. So, the signs of pruning are actually opportunities for growth in our faith and character, not attempts to destroy us. So when you find yourself in the middle of a storm, remember that God is with you. Your challenges are not punishments, but the refining fire that shapes your character. As Romans 5, 3-4 tells us, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Beloved, your trials are building your character for a greater purpose. Ultimately, you must remember that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When you see these signs of pruning around you, turn to Him. Hold on to Jesus as the constant, unwavering anchor in the storm. He is the one who will guide you through life's trials and prepare you for more. I encourage you to hold steadfast to your faith and prayerfully trust that God is working for your good. Surround yourself with godly friends who can support you and pray for you. Share your struggles and questions with them and let them help you find answers. Listen to their advice and encouragement from God's Word. You can also personally find verses that speak to your situation and comfort your soul. Memorize them and repeat them when you feel confused or discouraged. Apply them to your life and your situation. With His guidance, you'll emerge from this season stronger, wiser, and ready for the extraordinary future that awaits you. Have you ever felt a presence, a gentle nudge, or a whisper in your ear guiding you when you're at a crossroads? This might be more than just intuition. It could be a sign of angelic activity in your life. Angels, these celestial beings, are not just characters in ancient texts or beautiful paintings. They're real, active, and present in our lives today. Their role? To be God's messengers, protectors, and guides, silently weaving through our daily experiences. Let's explore the subtle yet profound ways angels might be interacting with you. 1. When favor comes from the most unlikely of places. Have you ever met someone, perhaps a stranger, who appeared at just the right moment with the right words or assistance? Imagine you're lost, maybe in a new city, feeling a mix of frustration and anxiety. Your phone's dead, no map in hand, and then out of nowhere, someone appears. They offer directions, maybe even walk a part of the way with you. But when you turn around to thank them, they're gone, as if they vanished into thin air. Could this be a mere coincidence? Or might it be an angelic encounter? Such moments are not just random acts of kindness. They might be divine appointments, carefully arranged by God with His angels as emissaries. Think about the story in the book of Hebrews, where hospitality to strangers led to unknowingly hosting angels. It's a powerful reminder to always be kind and open to those we meet. Or take the biblical story of Abraham in Genesis. He was visited by three strangers who brought a life-changing message. These weren't ordinary visitors. They were angels sent by God with a specific purpose. And in Judges, Manoah and his wife experienced a miraculous visitation by a stranger who prophesied the birth of Samson. This stranger, who later disappeared in a wondrous flame, was none other than an angel. These stories from Scripture aren't just ancient tales. 
They're examples of how angels can and do interact with us. They might not come with visible wings or glowing halos, but their impact is undeniable. They walk among us, often unnoticed, but always with a purpose. Angels can also make their presence known in times of need, offering comfort and peace. Picture yourself in a difficult situation, maybe in a hospital room, feeling alone and scared. Then someone comes in, sits beside you, and offers words of comfort. When you ask the nurse about them later, she tells you that you were alone the whole time. It's a moment that can leave you bewildered, yet comforted. A signature of an angelic visitation. These encounters, my friends, are signs of God's love and care for us. They're reminders that we're never truly alone, that in our most challenging moments, in our confusion and despair, God sends His angels to guide, comfort, and protect us. So next time you experience a moment of unexpected kindness, a timely intervention, or a comforting presence, take a moment to consider the possibility. Could this be an angel in my midst? These moments are not to be brushed off as mere coincidences. They are significant, impactful, and a clear sign of God's ongoing work in our lives through His celestial messengers. Two, you would begin to hear the voices of angels clearly. In the book of Acts, chapter 8, 26, picture this, Philip, just going about his day, hears an angel of the Lord. The angel tells him, Arise, go toward the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This wasn't a dream or a vague feeling. Philip was wide awake, hearing the angel's voice as clearly as if someone was speaking to him in person. So, you might wonder, could an angel speak to me? Absolutely! Angels are celestial beings, unfettered by our physical laws. They exist in a realm that's hard for our minds to grasp, and that includes the incredible ways they can communicate with us. When an angel speaks, it might not be with grandeur or a voice echoing from the skies. It could be as gentle as a breeze or as unassuming as a stranger's remark on the street. But remember, it's not about how the voice sounds. It's about the message it carries. Angels are God's messengers, and their words are meant to guide, comfort, and impart divine wisdom to us. They're not here to shock or scare us, but to offer guidance and assurance. So the next time you hear a voice that doesn't seem to have a source, don't rush to dismiss it. Stop for a second, listen intently. What's it saying? Is it a word of encouragement, a caution, or a nugget of divine truth? In our busy lives, we often overlook these subtle hints. But if we tune our hearts to listen, we might just realize that angels are speaking into our lives more often than we think. 3. Encounters in the Stillness of Dreams and Visions In the quietude of our dreams and the vividness of our visions, we often find a profound connection to the divine. It's an experience as old as time itself, transcending the ordinary and leading us into a realm of deeper understanding and guidance. The Holy Scriptures are replete with such moments where the veil between heaven and earth is lifted and God speaks to us through His celestial messengers, the angels. Consider the story of Joseph, the humble carpenter, chosen to be the guardian of the greatest story ever told. His world was upended, his heart troubled, not just by the ordinary woes of life, but by something that defied human understanding. His betrothed, Mary, was with child, and the whispers of society were as piercing as they were perplexing. It was in this whirlwind of confusion and concern that the divine reached out to Joseph, not through thunderous proclamations, but through the gentle whisper of a dream. An angel appeared to him, not with intimidating grandeur, but with comforting words. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 20-21 This wasn't just a dream to ease a troubled mind. It was a divine intervention, 
a celestial guide lighting the path for Joseph in his moment of doubt. This narrative is not just a tale from the past. It's a living testament to how God continues to speak to us today. Our dreams and visions are not mere figments of our imagination. They're often the canvas on which angels paint messages of hope, guidance, and sometimes caution. These celestial beings are not just distant observers. They are active participants in our journey. They're not only messengers, but also guardians, teachers, and guides appointed to serve those destined for salvation, as beautifully stated in Hebrews 1.14. So, the next time the world sleeps and you find yourself wandering in the landscape of your dreams, or when a vision grips you with its clarity and purpose, pause and listen. These moments are not coincidences. They're divine appointments. In these whispers of the night and flashes of insight, an angel might be reaching out to you with a message from heaven. It could be an affirmation, a direction for your path, or a cautionary tale. But always, it's a sign of the angelic activity, intricately woven into the tapestry of our lives. 4. You're walking through life, aiming for that mountaintop of triumph. But suddenly, the ground gives way, and you find yourself in a valley. It's easy to think, why me? But hold that thought. Remember Joseph from the Bible? His life seemed like a roller coaster that only went down. Falsely accused, thrown into prison, talk about a rough patch. Yet these were not just random events, they were divinely orchestrated steps leading him to become Pharaoh's right-hand man. Through his journey, Joseph saw God's hand turning every setback into a setup for a greater comeback. But what about when the setbacks are our own doing? Ever felt like Abraham trying to rush God's timeline? We've all been there taking the wheel from God, thinking we know all the shortcuts. Spoiler alert, it usually ends in a mess. But here's the beautiful twist. Our missteps are not the end of the story. They're often the very places where we encounter God's grace most profoundly. So, here's a question to stir your soul. In the midst of your setbacks and failures, can you see them as divine appointments? Can you trust that these are moments when angels might be working overtime, weaving God's purpose into your life's tapestry? It's in these unexpected detours that we're reminded we're not the ones in control here. And that's okay, because it's a chance to hand over the reins to someone who sees the bigger picture. Imagine embracing every setback as an invitation to lean closer into God's embrace, to listen more intently to His whispers of guidance and reassurance. It's in these moments that we're drawn one step closer to understanding our true purpose and destiny. Each failure, each delay, is a brushstroke in the masterpiece God's creating with our lives. So, my friend, the next time you hit a roadblock, take a deep breath and look around. Maybe, just maybe, there's an angel working behind the scenes, turning what seems like a setback into a divine setup. It's in these moments that we truly learn to dance in the rain, to find joy in the journey, and to see the fingerprints of the divine in every unexpected turn. Remember, the path to greatness often winds through valleys of trials, but each step, no matter how challenging, is leading you to a destiny greater than you could ever imagine. Keep walking, keep trusting, and let's embrace the journey together. Five. The illusion of satisfaction and the reality of divine presence. You've climbed the ladder of success, every rung a milestone, a coveted job, a dream partner, a life surrounded by luxury. Or maybe you're still yearning for these, glimpsing the ideal life through the glossy window of social media. But wait, there's a catch. A nagging emptiness shadows your triumphs or haunts your aspirations. It's like thirsting for a mirage in the desert of accomplishments. Now, let's pause and ponder. This sense of dissatisfaction, isn't it a sign? A subtle nudge, perhaps, that there's more to life than this relentless chase. The ancient wisdom of Ecclesiastes 6.9 echoes across time, whispering a profound truth. 
Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, chasing after the wind. It's a wake-up call, urging us to question the foundation we're building our lives on. Are we constructing our happiness on the shaky ground of worldly success? Or are we anchoring it in something more enduring, more authentic? It's time for a deeper inquiry. Instead of asking what's next in the marathon of achievements, let's shift our focus. Let's ask ourselves, are we pursuing a connection with the divine in our race for success? Are we seeking joy in the fleeting? Or are we embracing the eternal love of Christ? Remember the profound words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3.8, where he speaks of considering everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. This isn't about denouncing the material world, but about reorienting our priorities. It's about discovering contentment that isn't swayed by life's highs and lows, as mentioned in Philippians 4.12. So, let these moments of dissatisfaction not dishearten you, but guide you. They're not mere emotional disturbances. They are celestial signs, signs that there's more to life than material gains. They're invitations from angels, urging you to explore the depth of your soul, to connect with the divine essence that transcends worldly desires. This realization empowers us to hold the offerings of this world with a gentle grip, always ready to let go. For in the grand scheme of life, these are but temporary. The true treasure lies in building our hope on the unshakable foundation of Christ's love, a foundation that stands firm, even as the world around us shifts and crumbles. Keep in mind, every instance of dissatisfaction, every moment of questioning, could very well be a sign of angelic activity in your life, a heavenly whisper guiding you back to the path of spiritual fulfillment and eternal contentment. Let's embrace this journey, not with fear, but with a heart full of hope and eyes open to the celestial guidance that surrounds us. In the voyage of life, we sometimes sail through tumultuous seas where the winds of trials and tribulations threaten to veer us off course. It's in these tempestuous times that the divine narrative often unveils itself, showing us that the orchestrator of the universe has a grand design even in our moments of despair. In those junctures, God is working behind the scenes, laying the stepping stones that will lead to a metamorphosis in our lives. Often when our prayers seem to echo in an abyss or the heavens seem to turn to brass, we may be tempted to think that our cries go unheard. Yet, the Bible is rich with verses that remind us of God's unfailing love and His mighty power that operates even in silence. Take for instance, Isaiah chapter 65, verse 24. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Now, how do we steer through these seasons of stillness where God seems silent, yet is profoundly at work? How do we interpret the signs that a divine shift is on the horizon, ready to rewrite our story? Is the realization that every chapter in our life is penned by the divine author even when faced with adversities, James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 nudges us to consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The crucible moments are but a refiner's fire, purifying us, molding our character to reflect the image of Christ. The divine whispers often come in the form of closed doors or unforeseen challenges. Where one door shuts, another opens. It's God's way of rerouting our path, aligning us with His grand blueprint. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 6 reminds us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. Furthermore, the tapestry of our life is interwoven with relationships that are divinely orchestrated, encounters that spark a flame of change, nudging us closer to our destiny. God often places individuals in our path to mirror His voice, to act as vessels of change. Signs of a celestial shift may come in dreams or through a renewed sense of hope and faith, despite the prevailing circumstances. It's a gentle reminder from above that the dawn is near, 
as Romans chapter 8, verse 28 reassures. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So dear viewers, even when the world around seems chaotic, look for the divine clues. Embrace the journey with a heart of gratitude, knowing that every twist, every turn is a part of God's majestic narrative. For in the grand tapestry of life, each thread, no matter how entangled, is purposefully laid by the master weaver, setting the stage for a divine encore that will shift the narrative of our lives, manifesting his glory in ways beyond our imagination. Let's delve into the biblical narrative of Joseph, a young shepherd who traversed the path of betrayal, slavery, and imprisonment before ascending to the pinnacles of Egyptian governance. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 encapsulates the essence of divine orchestration. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. The adversities Joseph faced weren't mere coincidences, but divine arrangements setting the stage for a monumental shift in his life and the lives of many. Similarly, when the storm clouds gather in our lives, when adversity knocks, it's often a prelude to a divine symphony about to unfold. The discomfort, the unrest, the questioning, they are not just existential crises, but often divine nudges, urging us to look beyond the visible, to tune our ears to the celestial melody that orchestrates our lives. Now, let's reflect on those moments of unsettling quiet before dawn the so-called bad phases. They often arrive as unsolicited guests, leaving us bewildered. Yet, in that crucible of confusion, God is often forging a new narrative, a new chapter in our life story. Each challenge is a note in a divine melody, leading to a crescendo of transformation that reverberates through the essence of our being. It's crucial to anchor our understanding in the unwavering belief that God's love is constant through the ebbs and flows through the highs and lows. His love is not a fair weather companion, but a steadfast anchor. As Romans chapter 8, verse 28 reminds us, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Each trial we undergo, each seemingly insurmountable mountain we face, is often a stepping stone, a divine step for a new dawn, a new narrative. The signs are often subtle, the whispers of change often soft, Yet as we attune our hearts and minds to the divine rhythm, we begin to discern the unfolding script of God's magnificent plan. When adversities knock on our door, it's instinctual to seek a culprit, to point fingers at ourselves, at circumstances, or even at the Creator. However, this blame game veils the profound transformation awaiting us. The struggles we face aren't for naught, they are divine signals, heralding a forthcoming metamorphosis. Our trials are but a prelude to triumph, a crucible forging our character for the blessings to come. Now, in the heat of turmoil, it might seem like a Herculean task to discern these divine signals. Yet with a heart tuned to the whispers of faith, we can perceive them. The first sign is a sense of divine discontent, a holy unrest that propels us to seek God's face more fervently. It's a tender nudge urging us to abandon the shallow waters of complacency and to dive into the depths of divine reliance. The scripture vividly illustrates this through the narrative of Job. Despite being besieged by unimaginable calamities, Job's relentless pursuit of God's righteousness unveiled a grander blessing, a divine alteration in his life story. Job chapter 42 verses 10 through 17. His unwavering faith amidst adversity became a testimony of God's transformative power. Similarly, when we face unexpected roadblocks or find ourselves in a season of waiting, it's a sign. It's God's way of saying, pause, reflect, and draw nearer. It's a celestial beckon to lean not on our understanding, but to trust the divine script writer who is about to turn the page to a new chapter in our lives. Proverbs chapter three, verses five through six. Moreover, when our hearts are laden with the weight of unfulfilled dreams, when our prayers seem to echo in a void, it's a divine interlude. It's God whispering, my child, trust my timing. The Bible reassures us that God makes everything beautiful in its time. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse 11. Furthermore, 
The encounters with individuals who challenge our faith or perspectives are not mere coincidences. They are divine appointments meant to spark a flame of revelation, igniting a journey towards a higher understanding and a deeper relationship with God. Each trial, each waiting period, and every divine appointment is a meticulously orchestrated sign that God is at work, realigning our path, reshaping our desires, and redefining our destiny. So, when faced with the winds of adversity, let's not be disheartened, but be invigorated with hope, knowing that a divine narrative shift is on the horizon. Life's journey isn't a straight highway, but a winding road with a chair of ups and downs. It's akin to a riveting narrative with twists and turns, each chapter orchestrated by God to mold us into the individuals we are destined to become. When we find ourselves at a crossroad, it's crucial to reflect upon the signs God is presenting to us. Now, let's move into the biblical tale of Joseph, whose life was a testament to God's profound ability to transmute adversity into prosperity. Falsely accused and cast into the abyss of a dungeon, Joseph could have succumbed to despair. Yet, his unwavering faith was his beacon amidst the engulfing darkness. His narrative climaxed when he emerged as the Pharaoh's confidant, a remarkable twist showcasing God's magnificent plan in action. Similarly, the saga of Abraham, a paragon of patience and faith, unfolds as a comforting reassurance. His anguished wait for a progeny stretched over two and a half decades, a journey punctuated with moments of faltering faith. Yet, it was through this crucible of waiting that his faith solidified and God's promise materialized. The essence of these biblical anecdotes is a clarion call to introspection. When faced with setbacks, do we perceive them as mere roadblocks or as divinely orchestrated detours steering us towards God's grand design? Our perceptions can either entrap us in a quagmire of despair or liberate us into the realms of boundless hope and resilience. Now, envision a lush garden each flower bud veiled in a cloak of patience, awaiting the divine timing to unfurl into its full glory. Much like these buds, our lives are in a perpetual state of becoming, each challenge propelling us closer towards blossoming into the individuals God envisioned us to be. Now, suppose you've been encountering repetitive scenarios or emotions. These might be divine signposts urging a shift in perspective or action. Maybe it's a nudge towards breaking old, shackling patterns, and embracing transformative change. When the chill of isolation descends upon our lives, it's easy to misinterpret the scenario, to feel as though the world has turned a cold shoulder. However, this is far from the truth. The seeming desertion is not a verdict of rejection, but a divine setup for a deeper connection, a pulling away from the worldly crowd to create room for a heavenly crowd it's in this space of solitude that God begins to work on the canvas of our lives, painting a new picture that tells a story of His love, grace, and power. In the Bible, we see numerous instances where God set individuals apart before elevating them to their destined positions. Joseph's journey to the palace began with a pit in a prison, places of isolation, yet they were the very corridors that led to his destiny. Similarly, Moses' sojourn in the desert was a precursor to his monumental task of leading the Israelites to the Promised Land. The process of change begins with an inner transformation. Before the external circumstances of our lives can align with God's glorious plan, there needs to be a metamorphosis from within, a shedding of the old to make way for the new. This transformation is akin to the process of metamorphosis a caterpillar undergoes to become a butterfly, a profound change that unveils a new dimension of existence, echoing the scriptural truth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. The world around us may not understand this process, and its reaction could be one of opposition or misunderstanding. Yet, it's crucial to stay rooted in the awareness that this divine process is not to push us down, but to lift us up, to change not just our situations, but our stories. As our inner beings resonate with the nature of Christ, 
our external realities begin to mirror this divine nature, unfolding a narrative of hope, grace, and divine favor. This journey, though might be punctuated with challenges, is a beautiful unraveling of God's perfect plan for us. As we align with God's workings, staying patient and faithful, we will witness the glorious unfolding of a new chapter, a new story written by the divine author. If we are speaking to you, say a resounding amen in the comments section below.